kick it off. I'm going to record and get going. So here, here we go. Can you all still see my see my screen? Sweet. All right. So I am going to present Data Fusion. Oops, sorry. I'm going to present Data Fusion, Apache Data Fusion specifically. It used to be called Apache Arrow Data Fusion, but since we wrote this paper, it was promoted to its own top level project. I wrote this along with several uh, co-authors who are listed here, and it's a good swath of the contributors. So basically the story of this paper will not surprise anyone on this call probably because it's basically the same pitch I continue to give over and over again. But that is the future of databases is not, you're gonna, people will build tightly integrated brand new systems each time, but instead they'll build up for modular components. And data fusion is one of that, one example of the type of thing that'll underlie uh, these new systems. And of course, I always have the underlying motivation to convince more people to come work on data fusion with us. So that's another reason. The basic talk is I'm gonna, talk a little bit about data fusion the highlights, but you, I won't belabor that because that's covered in detail in many other places. I'll talk about some of the feature highlights, I think especially from that are interested from the research perspective. And then we'll talk about some of the performance analysis we did. So here is my personal favorite analogy of what data fusion is. Some people love this analogy, some people hate it. Some people don't understand what it means. I'll try to explain it. So LLVM stands for something like low level virtual machine or something, but it's basically a, a series of technologies and components that underlies languages that you've heard of, like C++ or, or Clang specifically, Rust, Julia, Swift, and a bunch of other ones. And the reason it's important is because there's a bunch of things that are required to build a modern compiler, like, like a modern language system, like a debugger, like optimized code generator, like all the standard optimizer stuff. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. The point is it's a huge amount of work, but it's not really differentiating for your particular language. So I think the reason we've seen a bunch of new innovative languages recently is because they've been able to share the same underlying infrastructure that's basically not differentiating and then focus on what makes the different languages different, right? Like, so Rust can focus on the borrow checker and the, some of the more advanced stuff there and not worry about optimized code gen for like x86 or whatever. And likewise, Swift and Julia and whatever. So my view is that that's the same role that something like Data Fusion plays. And there's other similar, similar technologies like Apache Calcite and Apache... I guess not Apache, Velox is another one. But the idea is rather than when you're building a database or other data centric systems, rather than continually re-implementing the same low level pieces that are basically required to get good performance, but are well understood and not really differentiating. Instead of redoing that, you share all the, the effort with Data Fusion and then you build uh, your actual application to focus on top, right? And so this is very much the architecture that Paul saw for InfluxDB 3.0 that we, we built on it, right? This specialized database could easily say InfluxDB 3.0, but now there's several other databases and other systems that, that follow the same path. So that's my that's my mental model. Apache Data Fusion's the LLVM of databases, or at least it's going to be. It's going to be awesome. So uh, I think I basically mentioned all this stuff in words in the last slide, but basically like the most rudimentary capitalistic view of this is you just share the cost of development across a bunch of projects so that you have access to technology you couldn't afford to build yourself. I think it's more interesting to think about sort of collaborating together to build something much cooler than you would have been able to, to build yourself. But at the end of the day, it's not really the features that are gonna make a difference for your product, it's the things you build on top of it. And it's a lot of work, right? Here's the use cases. Uh, We've all talked about this, you know, there's InfluxDB and several other time series databases like CoreLogix and RepTimeDB or whatever their thing's called now, CoreADB maybe. Um, and there's the streaming platforms and much of other sort of database type systems. Other things people use Data Fusion for are like specialized runtime. So they don't use the whole of Data Fusion, they use just pieces of it. So there's a project called uh, Comet, which is an accelerator for Apache Spark. It basically swaps out the execution engine. And there's equivalent ones for Postgres, whose one of them was built by a company called CFOWL, whose Vega is a some sort of visualization language, InfluxQL, right, our, our fancy ones. There's also people who use it just for the SQL part, like the SQL parts from the analysis representations. And it's also kind of interesting that all the table formats, the main, main table format Rust implementations, all end up using Data Fusion to the best of my knowledge. That's Delta Lake, Apache Iceberg, Lance, I'm not 100% sure about Hootie if there is a Rust implementation. But the reason that is because to build one of those table formats, you need to have elements of a query engine specifically to implement delete predicates and compaction and that kind of stuff, right? Like that's that's basically query engine stuff. And so when you need that, rather than re-implementing it as whatever your table, fun, uh, table format implementation is, you can just use data feature. 
All right, so the reason why, so why haven't people done this for the last 20 years, right? Traditionally, the story is that if you if you don't have a tightly integrated engine, something like DuckDB or Vertigo, Spark or whatever, that your performance will not be good enough, right? So you basically need to optimize the interfaces between the file format and the memory layout and a whole bunch of other stuff to, to achieve peak performance. And you can still see this, right? Like DuckDB has its own file format, right? Its own memory layout. And so they, they purposely designed those those internal interfaces to, to with best of breed understanding. So um, the counter argument that this paper makes is that you now that we understand where the boundaries should be drawn, you don't actually give up any performance by making a modular system, right? We basically show data fusions, performance is on par with actually .db, I'll talk about that in a second, but it's, it's extensible in every place. So that's that's like the thesis of the paper and why we think it's interesting. So data fusions architecture at a high level basically is designed not to be surprising, right? If you've ever seen how a database query engine works, it should look basically like data fusion. The high level goal is that you have a basic simple system that works out of the box, but that every feature that you can imagine is customizable by a subplugin, right? Using using the Rust Rust extension mechanisms. And so it's not unlike other systems where like, yes, you can add user defined functions, but they use some special, you know, like they they go down some little slower path of the built-in ones. Like the goals of data fusion is every single thing that's built in, you can also extend using the same same APIs. You know, uh, some places that's better than others, but that's basically the goal. And so the reason that we do that is so people can start with a simple high performance engine with relatively low overhead, right, compared to building something yourself, and then spend their time specializing the particular features to whatever they need. And so, you know, several people have reported it's been very cool that they can try out new ideas like new join algorithms or new, you know, ways of doing aggregation or whatever. Um, and they can test out how well that works in the context of an actual system rather than have to do some toy experiment or whatever where the results might or might not transfer it to a real system. And, uh, and I've had, we've had a bunch of people do that, which is kind of cool. Here's the architecture. If you've ever seen me talk about data fusion, this will not be surprising to you. It's, and it also, frankly, if you've ever seen how any other query engine is laid out, it won't be surprising to you. We have representations for the catalog, right? What tables exist, that sort of stuff, various front ends, different languages, a bunch of them that are built in, the green boxes, a bunch of stuff that you, extension points that you can extend with those, which are the blue boxes. There's the logical plans, right? So most query engines that these days split the representation of the plan into two two relatively different levels of, of uh, abstraction. The first is like a logical plan. And that basically describes a high level, what operations you're gonna do when, but it doesn't have details like exactly what algorithm for the join you're gonna use or how the data is sorted or how it's partitioned or whatever. And then there's a lower level one, which data fusion has execution plan. There's a bunch of rewrites that happen on the representations at both levels. Um, and then there's also a whole host of optimized implementations of those operators, which are called streams in data fusion. And you can of course extend those as well. We, by the way, every one of these blue boxes we use in Influx db 3 All right, so now I have like three or four very dense slides that are full of lots of text, which I don't really expect you to read. I'll throw out some highlights here, but the whole point of the showing this list is to give you some sense of like when I sort of hand waved at the beginning of the talk that this is a big amount of effort to build one of these query engines, right? Like, well, why is that, right? And the reason is because the features you need for something to be a query engine is actually pretty big, major. So you need, for example, representations of all like the expressions, expression trees, and then also the logical operators like filtering and grouping and joining and that sort of stuff. And of course you need to be able, you have the APIs to extend that, the APIs to, to build those structures and modify them and write analysis and stuff on them. Uh, you need a way to represent catalog, catalog information, like what tables and schemas and stuff are available. And of course the API to extend it. You need actually the actual planning of SQL text right into a, initial plan is actually a non-trivial piece of code. So you need one of those. Um, we also have a data frame API, and then there's also programmatic ways to build plans directly, which again, we, we use all that stuff in, in IOX. Likewise, it actually turns out a major chunk of implementing SQL is actually not just the semantics of SQL, but also the huge function libraries that people expect to have, like all the date time manipulation functions, for example, and string manipulation functions and data type, date type conversions and you know, all that stuff. Again, I don't think, it, like you basically would do it all in a basic CS 101 or basic database 101 class, but the amount of effort required to implement it is like, it just takes a lot of time, AKA money. 
Uh, likewise, there's basically the same level of styles from the physical physical level, right? That you have to have representations for all the different operators in the physical plans and ways to extend it. There's different operators like, you know, would it surprise you? I think data fusion has five different distinct join implementations depending on the different combinations, right? So there's like hash join and merge join and sort merge join. And uh, I think there's nested loops join in there. And there's also cross join and there's symmetric hash join maybe. So not that you have to know what any of that stuff is. The point is they're like, oh, and the, by the way, they all handle inner and outer and full outer and semi join and, and stuff like it's just, it takes a bunch of time. And there's optimized sorting implementations, like top K implementation, all that kind of stuff. We opted to provide at the beginning five data sources. So this is like Parquet, Avro, JSON, CSV, and Arrow. But you people can and do add their own table providers, right, with their own formats using the same exact same APIs that these built-in ones use. There's also optimizers. Uh, you optimize your basically plan rewrites. They basically rewrite the, the plan into more optimal form. A lot of the stuff is not, you don't have to know what this is, but like we do type coercion and constant propagation and join flattening, which basically removes outer joins. We do various push downs of limits, filtering, expression simplification, CSE, all that kind of stuff. There's 20 plus of them. Actually, there's more than that, but the goal, the, the point is not, none of that is in individually complicated. However, as a whole, it's basically what you need to have fast query plans and it's a lot of work. Uh, execution list, maybe this is more interesting. I don't know how many of the people on this call will appreciate it, but there's recently, uh, I would say an obsession in the database implementation world about uh, what's called the uh, morsel driven parallelism, which is a style of execution called push-based, which, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. But data fusion uses a very classic pull-based exchange model, which again, if you don't know what that means, that's fine, but that's a classic data database implementation technique. Turns out it works real well. That's part of what our results are all about. Um, you have to do streaming, right? The implementations of the operators don't consume all the input, then start producing output unless they have to. They incrementally produce output. We can use all the cores. We actually use Tokyo as the thread scheduler. And it was a way to account for memory. All right, so that's like the high-level text blast. Um, I'm purposely going quite fast through that. If you would like more detail, I would refer you to read the paper. Instead, now I'm gonna throw some of the examples up and just like to give you a flavor of what's going on. So in the execution model, just the, you would start with a, there's a, there's an op, you know, you'd call it the physical operator or the physical plan. This is the filter exec. So that's the, the physical plan. In this case, the four, it has four partitions. It's like applying some predicate, right? It's basically figuring out which con when the columns have that value. And so the mental model is because there's four partitions, you end up with actually four distinct uh, copies of the operation happening at once at runtime, right? Across four different cores. And these purple things are meant to represent record blocks, record batches going in and coming out, right? So each one can process the inputs entirely independently and produces outputs entirely independently. Um, yes, yeah, so I think I point out there's four partitions. This basically means the plan's parallelism is specified at planning time. It can't adjust at runtime really, at least modulo some details. Uh, these green things are called streams. If you hear me talk about that, the, the purple ones are called record batches. So what does that actually look like in code? Uh, I think this is amazing. I'm not sure how many other people think it's not, but in order to implement a pull-based system, what, what you need to do is you need to write each one of your operators to you know incrementally consume some input and then incrementally produce some output. So what does that actually look like in Rust? I told you we used Rust in Tokyo. Let me show you what it looks like. So the first thing you might do is you would say, you know while I still have input, so this is how you express that in Rust. Input is the input operator, right? You say next, and then you call this await thing, which I'll talk about in a second. But then when the next batch is there, right, you can think about pulling the next input from your 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 um, your input, the next batch from your input. So that's like 4,000 rows or 8,000 rows or something. You then do whatever processing you might have on it. And if you have output to generate, you uh, you return the record batch to the caller. Right, so in this this case, the returning, like this is the Rust incantation you need to return, you know, everything was fine, here's some data. Uh, but I also, so that's the pull model, but I wanted to point out several things. First of all, this a weight is very, very important, this thing. So this, in the model of, uh, of a pull-based executor, you need to basically be able to stop if you don't, like if the input isn't ready, you have to return control back to the caller so that it can go do whatever, right? Potentially get the input ready. And so, 
this a weight is the Rust compiler actually generates that uh, cooperative multi-threading control return for you and marshals all the statements. So while this looks like it's straight line code, what's actually happened under the covers is the Rust compiler has generated something where like if the input's not ready, it'll immediately return. And, and actually what actually happens is the program actually returns here at each a weight call, it returns back to the Tokyo scheduler and the Tokyo scheduler then tries to figure out what to do next. In this case, the Tokyo scheduler will try to call, will try to actually invoke whatever this this thing wants. So I'm not going to try to explain how how it all works in detail now. But the point is, in my mind, the fact that you have compiler generated continuations is is a huge huge advantage. So the Rust code looks very straightforward, even though you're able to implement a non-blocking cooperative multi-threading system. Hopefully that wasn't too many buzzwords. So how many does it? How well does it work? Way to find out is we compared this against we compared our system against DuckDB, which I think is a is basically the the current best example of a well integrated single node database system that operates on local files, which is basically what Data Fusion does. Our conclusion, and I'll show you how we arrived at that in a second, is that the architecture of Data Fusion is just fine. It actually works, and we basically get similar performances DuckDB, and the difference is basically engineering effort. The reason we conclude that is because sometimes Data Fusion is faster, sometimes DuckDB is faster. This is probably the most interesting result in the study. It's also driven a huge amount by the number of times I've had to answer people why data fusion doesn't use more so driven parallelism. So what this experiment is, I don't have a chip on my shoulder. No, I do. Uh, so what this experiment shows is, is we took the sequence of ClickBench queries, which I can talk about a little bit in a second, but they're basically aggregation heavy uh, analytics queries from ClickBench running on hundred parquet files. And we ran them on a machine that was the biggest we could rent at the time. I can't remember how much it cost, like two bucks an hour or something, maybe. So it's not, it's pretty expensive. It had 176 cores, and we basically just ran the same query with the different engines, DuckDB and Data Fusion. We ran them as the, you know, with one core, two cores, four cores, eight cores, whatever. So these are log scales. This is query runtime. And you're just basically plotting how well does the system's performance uh, proceed as you, as you add cores, right? So the big take, so here's the, it's the same picture. So by the way, this is what our intern uh, JG last summer did. Like he, he came up with this chart, it was great. So what my takeaway from this basically is if you look at these, most of the shapes look very similar, right? The actual values are different in different cases, right? Sometimes, the, you know, actually often DuckDB is faster, but sometimes Data Fusion is, but basically the shapes are the same. And so what that means is as you add more cores, the actual sort of behavior of the system uh, are the same. And so my personal conclusion is that that means that this, the, the purported benefits of morsel driven parallelism, one of which is it scales much better to higher core counts. Uh, I didn't find that in any of our results. Instead, basically, I found that the whole driven parallelism with, with Tokyo basically worked the same. And I, and I have a little more detailed depth analysis of some of these in a second. But basically, the shapes are the same. Like, that's the conclusion of this, this picture. Let's dive into a couple of them. Pardon for my really crude drawings here. So basically on certain query, like a lot of queries have this kind of like curve shape in an ideal system, right? You, like, what does this mean? This means as you increase the number of cores, the query runtime decreases linearly, right? Because both of these are log scales. So that that's what you'd expect, right? As you add more and more cores to the system, you'd expect the ideally that the runtime goes down. Now, of course, we actually see around 32 cores, it hits a minimum. And actually after you add more cores, it goes up this is a common occurrence in multi-threaded systems. And basically what happens at this, like this um, inflection point is that the amount of effort required to coordinate across the cores starts dominating the amount of work the cores actually do. And so as you add more cores, that overhead to schedule across the cores starts increasing. And so that's why the, you know, as you add more cores, the query time actually slows down. Right? So it actually takes longer to finish the query. But as you see, right, both the systems basically show the exact same behavior. And, I, and I, it's 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 entirely because it's once you get here, there's like the amount of work the cores are doing compared to the amount of work required to shuffle is is um becomes quite small. Does that make sense? Hopefully. All right. There are actually a couple of so it's actually kind of interesting. So now you look at some outline, like a lot of those have this like J hook curve. It's kind of interesting to look at the ones that don't have the J hook curve. Here's a couple that don't. And these ones, if you look at what query 28 and query uh 30, uh let's see, query like what this one's doing, query 28 is doing, that this query actually takes quite a long time in absolute sense to run. And the reason is because it has a very expensive predicate 
and it's got a relatively low cardinality aggregation. So the input data sets 100 million and the output, there's like 6,000 groups or something. So that means two things. It means the amount of effort required as the data comes in, right? All the, it, like all the cores can read individual pieces of the files in parallel. They have to apply a very expensive predicate, a regular expression in this case, right? So there's a lot of CPU to do, to, to work on. And then they're all actually quite effective. The initial uh, aggregation phase is very effective. So they can basically, without going into details of how this is implemented, you basically do the filtering and aggregation. You, you, you basically do almost all the work as soon as you read the data out of the file. There's, you don't have to do any work after you've done a lot of cross stuff. Versus, I think, yeah, when you get queries that have higher groups, right? Like this is this has 14 million groups where the original input uh, cardinality is 100 million. So in that case, actually, the amount of data you have to swap between the cores is very high compared to the amount of uh, effort they're able to, to get rid of. So so that's why you see in a query like query, oops, query 32 that the time goes up significantly after uh, higher core counts. And again, if you care about any of this, you can go read the paper. It's all scripts are all there. It's all, it's all great stuff. Um, we also did a couple of experiments that were single core efficiency. So this is basically, you know, like, sorry, we did some scaling experiments, show how well the system scaled. Let's talk about how well each system uses a single core as a, as a measure of how efficiently the, co the operations are implemented. To do this, we did a smaller machine. I think it had eight cores on it or something, but we basically pinned each machine to a single core and then just saw how fast we could run the queries. We ran all 43 ClickBench queries against these. These don't have joins, right? These are aggregations of filters. Um, and what did we find? We found for certain queries, data fusion's faster, uh, in particular ones where the predicates were quite selective, selective meaning it filtered out most of the rows in the predicate. We attribute this to the fact that we spent a lot of time in data fusion pushing predicates down into the parquet scan. And since I, and I don't think DuckDB has spent as much time doing that, partly because they have their own file format that they've optimized for rather than parquet, perhaps. Um, but yeah, like these queries select you know, less than 1% of the rows, but, but data fusion goes faster. Uh, we also found for queries where there's single aggregates data fusion went faster, like there's no group by in these queries in particular, right? Like they just basically scan all the rows and just compute some giant aggregation. Uh, data fusion seems to be faster than DuckDB for that, probably because our implementation is quite vectorized, but who knows? I don't really know. I'm sure they, DuckDB might have gotten faster too. By the time you move into queries that have medium cardinality and medium uh, selectivity, so they're like not at, they're not crazy selective, but they're also not like taking all the data. You find the systems are about the same in terms of performance. You know, sometimes one's faster, sometimes one's slower, but basically there's no particular pattern. And then when you get to higher cardinality, uh, that's where you see DuckDB has a significant advantage, uh, has an advantage. I think this is, if you read a, a lot of what they've focused on, they've spent a lot of time work optimizing the high cardinality group by case. Among other things, they had a smart PhD student, I believe his name is Lauren, is working on this as his PhD work for CWI. So, which is fine, right? That, that means when they put a lot of effort into it, they made it a lot faster, that, that's great, right? But I don't think there's anything fundamental about the architecture that, that would prevent you know, us from getting a smart CWI student as well, spending four years optimizing group by hash and have it go really fast too. We already have it going pretty fast, but it could be faster. All right, we also did similar, you know, you gotta do TPCH if you ever were into this now analytics space. Um, we ran TPCH scale factor one on parquet files after we converted the data to parquet. Again, we basically found there's certain times where data fusion is faster. DuckDB is faster in general. These ones are where data fusion is faster and they have selective predicates on them. The other queries, it's often about the same. Maybe DuckDB is a little bit faster in, in certain cases. Most one thing that's important to note here is that almost all the TPCH queries except I think one and four and there's, a, there's only a few, but almost all of them have joins basically. So you can read this as, you know, DuckDB's join implementation probably is better than data fusion for a lot of these, these queries. There's a couple of them that are really bad, like 17 and 18, where data fusion is particularly bad compared to DuckDB. I looked into those, what they actually turn out to be is that the join order is wrong with, if anyone's ever, and so we subsequently fixed it, but like it's some stupid thing where like it's all wrong because the cardinality estimates of the output of a subquery weren't right or you know weren't weren't as good as they could have been or something like that. So you know how important that particular thing is in practice, I'm not so sure. But you know my conclusion is basically we're within the we're in the same ballpark as 
DuckDB, and if we really cared about optimizing TPCH, I'm quite confident we could get it faster. We also played games with the H2, another fun uh, benchmark that people love to do is H2O, which is some data AI, I don't know. H2O is like an AI company. I'm not really sure what their current company status is, but they made a set of benchmarks that they published at some point, which are basically benchmarks on CSV files that are represent what uh, data scientists would do, or at least did, you know, about five or 10 years ago. It turns out these database, uh, these benchmarks are basically benchmarks of how fast your CSV parser is, but there was, there were some interesting things. So, you know, most of the queries actually did fusions faster than DuckDB on these. This is probably because of the CSV parser that wasn't hundred percent. Like JG looked into this and actually filed a ticket with the DuckDB people asking them why it was like, seemed to be so much slower and they, you can read the ticket, but it's something about maybe the using only a single core penalized DuckDB more than it should have been, or like, I, like I can't remember, but it's not like, I have no doubt that DuckDB can make, make these faster or that we can make them faster or, or the places where data fusion was slower. If you look at it, it's actually because it's using one of these uh, implementations of an aggregate we hadn't optimized really yet. Median being one, that's actually much better now in data fusion. Correlation is not something we've yet optimized. If anyone wants a fun project, you want to go implement, you know, a fast vectorized correlation. That's more than I'll be happy to tell you how to do it. It won't be that hard, but someone's got to do it. So the conclusion from all this yakking basically is that the relative performance, in my opinion, and, and what our research showed was that it reflects engineering effort. Probably won't surprise any engineers on the call, right? Re much more so than the higher level architectural choices here. You know, we, we volcano style exchange parallelism, which people might, that might not be the current vogue in database implementation, but it worked just fine on our measurements up to 174, two cores and didn't seem to be any significantly worse than uh, the push-based style of morsel driven parallelism. And I'm sure both engines can and will get faster. I certainly plan to make data fusion faster as much as I can. So therefore the current, the conclusion is right. You can have all this open source uh, extendable architecture and still get very fast performance. So that's, that's basically the conclusion. Thank you all for listening. I hope that's somewhat interesting. I have like 12 minutes to do this at the at TPCH or actually at the actual Sigma conference. So I don't really know how I'm going to do that. Probably just talk faster and fast faster. You know, I, I, Paul, Paul smiled because he taught me that, but no, I, 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 I'll cut out a bunch of this stuff about the features. But, but you only have 12 minutes to give that whole talk. I, I'm going to, I know how I'm going to do it. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Oof. You can talk minutes? faster, but there's a limit. <laughs> no, I know. I'm just, I'm not going to talk about any of those features is, is the plan. I think the results is interesting and I won't spend as much time yakking about morsel driven parallelism because I'll either assume they're know what it is or they don't care and then not going to grok it in 12 minutes anyway. So. So you say I mean, 20 think, minutes for the talk and 10 minutes for the, the question. Do you only have 12 minutes? That's what they told me. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, like, oh, by the way, actually, a talk is 20 minutes now. And the thing is, you can you can probably ditch a lot of the, or you can 